Andrews been described his poetry in the press as poems exploring daily routines of ordinary experience at work, home, and community. They've appeared in numerous publications. He's been published in journals, and he's also an award-winning slam poet. And he works with children and has been quoted in the Globe as saying that poetry can be a healing art form to express feelings and comfort and console us. He's a founder of Potato Hill Poetry. I believe the name comes from a potato farm out in Vermont. And uh, he has been working with children to get them to understand how poetry is connected to everyday lives. Since 1994, he's provided workshops, residencies, and readings across the country. And there have been some magazines for both teachers and students associated with his poetry that have uh, come out and, as well. And Andrew is also quoted as saying um, about Potato Hill that it's dedicated to promoting the sometimes far-fetched notion that poetry belongs to us all and not just a select few. And I'd like to add, and that's why we're here. And I look forward to what Andrew Green has to share with his own words this morning. And I'd like to invite you to please help me welcome him up here, Andrew Green. Um, Potato Hill does come from a mountain in Vermont, the other side of Sugarbush Mountain, where people ski. Uh, used to have many dairy farms, somewhere close to 40 plus um, around the time of World War II. And the last of those dairy farms uh, went out of business when I was living up there in the late 80s. Um, farmers used to grow potatoes. There weren't actually potato farms, but they had potato patches as they were referred to. And so the locals called this place Potato Hill. And I lived at the bottom of Potato Hill. And when I invited some friends for a poetry reading one night, I said, come to Potato Hill for poetry. And the alliterative sound stuck. How could you resist it? Yeah. So when I needed to uh, come up with a name for the organization dedicated to poetry, Potato Hill was not far away. Um, I spend a fair amount of time in schools working with kids doing poetry residencies. And uh, the first poem I'm going to read comes from a particular class in New Hampshire. The poem is called Each Morning. Each morning in third grade, we sit in a circle on the gray rug in Mr. Zimmer's class. Good morning, Melissa. Good morning, Jacob. Good morning, Tom. Good morning, Elizabeth. Speak clearly and slowly, Mr. Zimmer reminds us. Once greeted, we fold our hands on our laps where they lie still, like starlings on a telephone wire. Good morning, Ryan. Good morning, Tom. Good morning, Samantha. Good morning, Bob. Nothing attached to our names, nothing asked of us but this. The one just named chooses whom to greet next. To start the day with such clarity feels like a windshield wiped clear of rain. By mid-year, we all know the secret of naming, to hear ourselves out loud, welcomed into the day. Good morning, Tanya. Good morning, Lisa. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Eric. And so it goes about the circle, one after the other, calling out the names on our tongues in our hearts like small stars, each one of us waiting for the word that says to us just this, shine. Good morning, Emma. Good morning, Ricky. Good morning, Kate. Good morning, Andrew. Sometimes I get invited to the lunchroom. Kids will often ask me to, um, to avoid the teacher's room and come sit with them for lunch. And I will often say, only if we can write a poem about the experience. And sometimes we'll choose a form. And in this case, it was haiku. And this is my effort 
called Hat Trick Haiku, School Lunch. Cheeseburger thin coin, potato puffs, one cookie. You are stuck with me. <laughs> Kids caught in long line, lunch ladies in hairnets scoop, chop suey, green beans. Taco taquito, pears and diced pineapple, happiness fleeting. I used to have a very familiar routine, I'm sure many of you have had that, of um, putting a child to sleep uh, in the evening. This poem is called Sweet Dreams, I Love You, Leave on the Light. After we floss and brush her teeth, after a tickle upon her feet, after we pick out the morning clothes, it's time for reading, anything goes. After the final page is read, after the story I tell her in bed, each night it always comes down to this, a hug, a tuck, a bedtime kiss. See you in the morning, hun, good night. Sweet dreams, I love you, leave on the light. Mark had uh, some wonderful poems about the news and uh, this is a, a found poem. New York Post, March 29, 2004. An elderly Queens man yesterday put three bullets into his actor son, Vincent K. Ford. Known professionally as Keith Diamond, he was eating in the kitchen of the family's home when his dad, 81, opened fire with a 32 caliber revolver, hitting the actor once in the chin and twice in the torso. Police said the shooting was sparked by a disagreement involving medical care for the ailing mom, who neighbors said is suffering from cancer. There was no history of domestic disturbances at the house. They're nice people, very nice, said neighbor Lavica Harrison. They never argued. That's the strange thing. Of the elder Ford, a retired postal worker, she said, I never even heard him raise his voice. One day I found myself in a diner and um, uh, I was waiting for a friend to show up for, for coffee and, and uh, some poetry talk, and uh, just had one of those little moments uh, of grace come over me, and it led to, to this poem called It Might Happen. It might happen over coffee with a friend at a diner in South Bend, Indiana, or at a bookstore browsing alone with all those titles waiting just for you. Maybe you're listening to a saxophone, or digging in the garden, or having a catch with your brother. This feeling comes over you, a moment of grace, knowing all this is yours. The summer sky, the morning paper, a potato. Knowing you won't pass here again, ever. This, your one chance to pay attention. It might happen over coffee with a friend at a diner in South Bend, Indiana. This next poem I'm going to read is a longer poem called Without. I'm still learning about technology. It's changing as we, as we uh, live our lives, daily almost. Um, I had been fighting it at first, but I'm trying to catch on a little bit. This poem is called Without. How did we get along all these years without a cell phone connected to our ears? 
And how did we get along all these years without being able to dial up whomever we wanted, whenever we wanted, wherever we wanted? And how did we get along without 200 friends on Facebook to see our latest photos of our summer vacation in the Poconos and postings of how we spent our 34th birthday? And how did we survive without a Twitter account to break down our day and announce what we dreamt last night and how we feel about the latest version of Oreo cookies or Obama's political career in 140 characters or less? And how did we survive without blogs and apps, video games, and the instant photograph, the one you took five minutes ago of your mother standing on her front porch that you just sent to your sister, who's looking at it now on her cell phone 2,000 miles away in Omaha and texting you back a note about how she looks frail and the front porch needs a coat of paint. <laughs> how the photo makes her laugh and cry at the same time, how this is the age where thought becomes fact almost, almost at the same moment. Though it's all part of our lives now, I remember nothing of wanting or needing this technology as a kid. Growing up, thought there was already enough magic in the world, catching grasshoppers and lightning bugs, scooping ground balls at shortstop, walking to the corner store for boxes of raisinets and goobers, riding our bicycles through town, imagining with Kevin, who lived next door, how one day we might muster the courage to French kiss with Sally Dodson, or at least say hi. But that was still years away, and we had a bag of Doritos and a bottle of Mountain Dew to finish on the corner of Bayside Avenue, where we sat on the luxurious banana seats of our red and blue Schwinn bicycles under a wide sky, blue and big as tomorrow. Just a, a couple more poems, and I will, uh, a couple short poems, and I'll finish up here. This is called Life Lesson, or one of my daughters, whose nickname is Boo. Life Lesson for Boo. The hardest part was learning to sit still next to your sister on the couch, on the floor, at the table, learning to pick up the pieces to put away the blocks, learning to share a game, a doll, your dad, learning to say out loud, you can have some, Emma. I'll share this piece of candy with you, learning the secret pleasure of two. And I will finish up with A poem called, For Joy, For Luck, For You. For the sheer joy of motion, of symmetry, of movement, of doing the same thing each day, again and again and again, over and over and over until you get it right. Until you know that you've got it right so that it becomes a part of you, instinctual, animal, protean, pattern, and then to keep on for the sake of keeping on, same stroke, same scale, same stitch, same form, ebb and flow of rhythm over and over, stretching and stretching until finally one day you are ready to make a leap and try something new, a turn, a twist, a deviation, a palaver, backstroke, anapest, maxiford, metaphor to see something for what it might be beyond what you already know, to explore new territory, to leap like fish, like star, like agate, until you have created something unknown and discovered a new way of seeing, and then you work at it again and again until you get it down, until you know how to do it, stroke, scale, stitch, form, 
over and over until you remember why you are doing it in the first place, to know what it means, to know something, and then to forget it all for joy, for luck, for you. Thank you. Well, I had a string of uh, songs that I've written that were really, uh, really uh, deep and some would say sad. And so imagine my surprise when uh, this song popped out. And I'm really glad to see that big bucket of apples there. This is a great time of year for apples. When I was a boy, I wasn't very bright. I didn't know much, but I knew what I liked when the teacher sang the ABCs. All I could sing was apples and cheese, apples and cheese, apples and cheese. Some sing praise for carrots and peas. Nothing in the world can make a man say please. Like a great big plate of apples and cheese. Can you catch it on? Sing along with me. It's apples and cheese, apples and cheese. Some sing praise for carrots and peas. Nothing in the world can make a man say please. Like a great big plate of apples and cheese. That's right. Time came to learn about the birds and bees. My father shared this expertise. Son, there ain't no guarantee. Except for the joys of apples and cheese It's apples and cheese, apples and cheese Some sing praise for carrots and peas Nothing in the world can make a man say please Like a great big plate of apples and cheese It's Cortland Granny Smith, Macintosh McCoon Cheddar Gouda Brie, Swiss Provolone You'll never find me on a hunger strike I never met an apple or a cheese I didn't like It's apples and cheese, apples and cheese Some sing praise for carrots and peas Nothing in the world can make a man say please Like a great big plate of apples and cheese Get to heaven, let me tell you what I'll do. I'll be singing in the choir with the angels who raise their hands from bended knees. And praise the Lord for apples and cheese. It's apples and cheese, apples and cheese. Some sing praise for carrots and peas. Nothing in the world can make a man say please. Like a great big plate of apples and cheese. It's apples and cheese, apples and cheese. Some sing praise for carrots and peas. Nothing in the world can make a man say please. Like a great big plate of apples and cheese. Thank you. Thank you again and again for the words and the song. This is uh, over the years here have inspired me. So it's a first time of putting my <clears throat> storytelling years into 11 poems. And um, I, I would love to show it to my 25-year-old self, this little book called Gathering Threads. It makes me so happy to have it. Um, of the 11, I'll just read you the first one. It's called A Beginning. <clears throat> Poems, stories, even intentions need revision. And yet I subject glorious phrases, words saved here and there on scraps of paper to lie unseen between pages of my journals. Poems wait always wait. Just one image could make everything come out right. Poor trapped words always to remain lonely and static. 
without any middling or endings, they're doomed to wait, to be waited, always by another attempt, a new image. And then I got more and more. So thank you, everyone, and thank you for the encouragement from Cheryl and everything. Thank you. Let me read a poem about beauty, of which that first poem clearly was not. The night stirred at sea, and the fire brought a crowd in. They say that her beauty was like music in mouth, and few in the candlelight thought her too proud. The house of the planter is known by the trees, and men who had seen her drank deep and were silent. The women were talking wherever she went, like a gong that is rung, or a wonder told shyly. And oh, she was the Sunday in every week. Thank you. And I've been working on this poem and tweaking it. I could not quite recall if I've read it here before, but <clears throat> it's really um, been with me and you know how it is with the tweaking of poems. It's called Monarch Moment. Generations of monarch butterflies move across our continent. Each new generation takes the next step, remembering where to go. West in the fall and east in the spring, back and forth and back and forth again. Caterpillar to cocoon to winged being, on and on it goes, all of the stages marching across the North American continent, Turtle Island embracing the metamorphosis. And although we sometimes forget, we too must be part of a greater cycle. As the bloodlines surge forward, we have to know there is a greater pattern. A great melting pot occurred on Turtle Island following 1492. Europeans, Americans came together in a curious dance making a new civilization. Together they forged this new place called the many states of being in the new world, and these states were united. Most of the states were named after Native American tribes that were named after description of place. For example, Massachusetts named after the tribe of people calling themselves the people of many hills. Our new government was modeled after the government of the Seneca tribes, although the Supreme Court replaced the Council of Wise Women. This Council of Wise Older Women was responsible for ensuring the longevity of the tribe for the next seven generations, and they could veto any proposed action by all the other councils. Seven generations, 1620, 1675, 1730, 1785, 1840, 1895, 1950, 1995. Seven generations of people since the Pilgrim's Landing. Where are we going? Are we caterpillars or are we still in the cocoon? Or are we becoming winged butterflies? Thank you. Mr. Kringle arrives early. Oktoberfest in Germany comes but once a year. It's a time for revelry, when folks drink lots of beer. Hans Kringle was a young man who dearly loved his beer. But after a night of merriment, his thinking wasn't too clear. He wished to play a joke on a friend, and believing his thinking was 200 proof, Hans tried to climb through his friend's window, but somehow landed on the roof. Young Mr. Kringle saw an open hole and lurched over to see. He went headfirst through the window, only to learn it was a chimney. Hans whooshed 50 feet down the flue. Then by some dumb luck, his rapid descent halted when he became stuck. A sobered Hans shouted for help, but couldn't raise a peep. For everyone in the house was drunk and fast asleep. But God protects drunks and old folks, 
So someone finally heard Hans's shouts and called the fire department who pulled the reveler out. They then took Hans home and put him in his bed where he slept for 12 hours while sugar plums danced in his head. Thank you very much. And, uh, I, have, I have two short poems, so I'll read this one first. This is called Taking It In. Sitting quietly, attentive to life, watching, listening, taking it in. The sky ear so blue, the trees gentle rustling, watching, listening, taking it in. Moment to moment, life in the present, watching, listening, taking it in. That's my first poem. And this one I wrote some time ago, too, about my mother. Um, because of my, my uh, injury, I have not been able to, uh, to visit her. She's in a nursing home a good distance away, so I thought it would be sort of a way of visiting her by reading this poem. My beautiful mother, you welcome each day with beauty and grace, taking one moment at a time and never lose face. I admire you so. <laughs> and hope to achieve the faith, love, and kindness through each day that you weave. May today be as special as you are, dear mother. I love you and honor you, a space held for no other. Thank you. Chan.